Hi, good morning, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, this is beautiful to see all of you here. This week has been an incredibly thrilling and emotional week for me because, uh, as it was mentioned, my memoir was released on Tuesday, and it's been a really whirlwind of a week, and I'm really glad to be here as the week comes to a close. Today, I want to share some stories with you about what has shaped my perception of America and of what it means to be an American in 2016. I was born in Mexico and I came to live in the US when I was 11 years old. But before I came to live in the US, my perception of America and of Americans was very much shaped by what I saw on television. There were two shows that I used to watch regularly when I was living in Mexico that were dubbed in Spanish. One of them was Dennis de Menes, which most of you are too young to probably know. Um, and the second show was Beverly Hills 90210, the original version. And these two shows uh, very much shaped my perception. The other thing that shaped my perception was the summer vacations that I had in the U.S. So my experience as a tourist consisted of trips to Six Flags, Fiesta Texas, um, to SeaWorld, and to McDonald's. And so my um, idea of Americans was very much shaped by what I saw on television. That's Dennis de Menes, for those of you that have never seen it or know what it is. Um, it was a cartoon about this kid who had all sorts of great intentions, but he, everything always went wrong and he ended up getting into a lot of trouble. And that was kind of like me when I was a little girl. And one of the episodes, his house is being take away, taken away on wheels. And so I developed this idea that like all Americans lived in mobile homes. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever, and I wanted to move to the US and live in a mobile home. That idea was also coupled with what I saw on Beverly Hills 90210. So I thought, America is great. You go to high school and you never have to go to class. Um, America was, seemed great to me. I couldn't wait to come live here with, with my parents. But the problem with my perception being solely shaped by what I saw on television is that it was a very one-dimensional view. Everyone who was in these shows was beautiful, rich, and white. So I didn't think that I would fit into America because I had never seen someone who looks like me portrayed on television. Of course, when I came to live in the U.S. at the age of 11 and I went to class, especially in a city like San Antonio, I, of course, saw kids who looked like me. They didn't, they didn't all speak Spanish, which was strange to me. Um, but, but once I came to live here and I actually experienced America firsthand, my perception started to change. And I started to believe that, in fact, I could be a makeup of the fabric of America. So all of us, whether consciously or unconsciously, are shaped by what we see on television. And it's easy to see how someone might have a one very specific view of immigrants, because what we see on television tends to be the one narrative that we see about immigrants. And that narrative is that we're all crossing the US-Mexico border, that we all are criminals, and that we all come here to take. And I will tell you today some stories that will hopefully give you a different perspective. What is, uh, and please shout it out, I know you guys are not a shy audience from what I've been told and from what I've seen so far today. What are some words that come to your mind when you hear the word American? What do you associate with that word and who do you associate with that word? I like that one. <laughs> hmm. We'll get to that one, maybe. Um, what about the word immigrant? What are some of the words that come to your mind when you hear the word immigrant? Irish. I heard Irish back here. Mexico. The American dream. All of us. Great. I want to show you a short video. There is an online uh, news site called AJ, and they went around asking different people what they thought of the word immigrant. So I want to show you this video, and then we get back to it.
I really wanted, I really wanted to show you that again. Did any of those words that you hear, were there any of those words that you thought, yes, I agree with that? I'm sure there were, both from the good perspective and, in my mind, the not so good perspective. Um, so, as you can see, the word immigrant and, and this topic of immigration tends to be a very political issue and a very polarized issue. Um, when I was 14 years old, I, so I came to the U.S. using a tourist visa. And then, that's one really big misconception that people have. People think that all undocumented people cross the border illegally. My case was that I came here with a tourist visa. And 40% of the undocumented immigrants in this country let their visa expired or their visa expired and they couldn't renew it. And that's how they became undocumented. When I was 14 years old, just as I was beginning to fit, to feel American, and to start, I started fitting in at school, I started learning English, and I was beginning to feel American. But just when that happened, my visa expired. And I became what some people, as we saw in the, in the short video, call an illegal alien. But I have to tell you, I didn't feel alien. And I certainly didn't feel illegal. I don't even know how a person can be illegal. That term is incredibly dehumanizing. And when people tell me, tell me that they don't find the term dehumanizing, I think that's because it's not dehumanizing them. It's like telling a patient that it doesn't hurt when the patient is telling you that it does. But that's what I had become. I had become an undocumented immigrant. And that word illegal, I really started to internalize it. And it was almost a source of shame for me. I was all of a sudden ashamed to be an immigrant. I thought it was something bad and something that I didn't want people to know about me. And every decision that I made from that point forward had to do with my immigration status. There wasn't a single decision that I could make that didn't involve thinking and considering my immigration status. But the first time that I realized being undocumented had real life consequences was when I was applying to college. How many seniors do we have here? Okay. Um, so I don't have to tell you the stress about applying to college and the SAT tests that we have to take and the essays we have to write and the whole college process, the scholarships we have to apply to. So I did all of that. And I graduated in the top 5% of my high school class. I think and I believe that I could have gotten into any number of colleges, but I kept getting rejected from every single college I applied to. And it wasn't because my SAT scores didn't meet the standard. It wasn't because my GPA was too low. It wasn't because I wasn't involved in extracurricular activities at school. It was because I didn't have a nine-digit social security number. So every single school that I applied to, I was rejected from. 
And today, there are still 65,000 undocumented students who graduate each year from high school who have very limited options to continue their education. I was very fortunate because in 2001, and I know this is going to be shocking to hear, but in 2001, Texas became the first state in the country to allow undocumented students to go to college, pay in-state tuition, and receive state financial aid. I graduated high school in 2001. Don't do the math of how old I am. Um, so this, this map will show you the states that have followed in Texas footsteps. And there's been about 15 states that now, 15 years later, allow undocumented students to attend state colleges and universities. Some states, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, the, state, the, the laws that they have enacted are actually to ban undocumented students from attending college. But as I said, I got really lucky because that law passed at the exact right moment that I needed it. And that gave me an opportunity to continue on my path and on my pursuit of the American dream. When I was a freshman at the University of Texas at Austin, hook em horn, we are 2-0. Uh, as I was walking through the Texas campus, I felt incredibly lucky to be there. But my parents had made a really incredible sacrifice in order for me to go to college. We used to sell funnel cakes uh, on the streets of San Antonio. And that just wasn't enough money for us to live and then for me to go to college. So my parents made the decision that they would go back to Mexico. My mom had also suffered a really terrible accident and needed a lot of care. And so my extended family in Mexico rallied together to be able to take care of my mom. And then I took over that funnel cake stand. So every weekend, my freshman year in college, I would take a Greyhound bus for 90 miles from Austin to San Antonio on Friday nights to go sell funnel cakes. And then on Sundays, I would get in that same bus and go back to Austin with money to pay for school. And let me just paint a picture for you. I'm in this Greyhound bus, and I have a backpack, and that backpack is full of cash, five ones, twenties, because as an undocumented immigrant in 2001, I couldn't open a bank account. So I just had this backpack full of cash, and I'm sitting on the Greyhound bus, and I'm exhausted from being on my feet for 12 to 14 hours selling funnel cakes. All I want to do is fall asleep, but I can't because I'm afraid that I have all this cash with a, bunch, with a, with a bus full of strangers. And I remember one day, my roommate, um, I, had, I, had this, I had just poured the cash um, into a, 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 underneath my pillow. And she was looking for something, and she found this stash of cash. And I think she wondered, what did I really do on the weekends? Um, and of course, I couldn't tell her the reason I have all these fives and ones is because I can't open a bank account. Luckily, today, undocumented immigrants can open bank accounts. Um, and and that's, that's a really great thing. And it's a really great thing for our economy for that cash to be in, in the banking system. Um, so when I, I, was, I, I was worried about what is going to happen to me when I graduate from college, because there's still not a way for me to fix my immigration status. And this is another misconception that people have. I often hear, um, I often hear the anti-immigrant rhetoric say, you should get in the back of the line. Do it the right way. Get in the back of the line. And I can tell you that for me and for millions of people, that line doesn't exist. There's no way for us to do it the right way. I came here when I was 11 years old. It wasn't my choice. I didn't have a say in the matter. But once I was here and I started to build a life here, there was no line for me to get on to fix my immigration status. So I continued going through college, focusing on the things that I could control. And there all, in life, there are a million things that are outside of our control. But what I could focus on was how hard I studied, how hard I worked. I could focus on uh, trying to find internships, even though I didn't know if I was actually going to be able to take them on. At the end of my freshman year, the city of San Antonio decided to build a museum in the place where I had my funnel kickstand. And I uh, blamed art for all of my troubles. Um, and once the city of San Antonio built that museum, I lost my source of income. And I had to make a decision. I could either drop out of school and give up on myself and give up on the sacrifice my parents had made, or I would figure out a way to continue to pay for college. And let me remind you, I wasn't eligible for financial aid. I couldn't take out loans. And there were very, at that time, there were no scholarships that were open to undocumented immigrants. And so the only way that I could continue to pay for my education was to get a job. 
but how do I get a job if I don't have papers? And that's when I made this decision, when I was 19 years old, to buy fake documents. I bought a fake green card and a fake social security card. And I used those documents to get a job at a calling center. So working 30, 40 hours a week, going to school full time, trying to make it work. I was very lucky that I got an internship with the Chicago Fire, the Major League Soccer team. And it was a non-paid internship. The only way that I could make money was to dress up as the mascot. And so you were looking at probably the shortest MLS mascot in history. But it paid the bills. And I went there, I had my internship, and I started to develop this idea that money in America fixes all problems. And that if I could just become really rich and successful, then who would want to turn me away? And maybe, somehow, I would be able to fix my immigration status. I eventually saved enough money to buy a car so that I wouldn't have to ride the Greyhound bus. However, getting behind that wheel of a car, every time I got behind that wheel of that car, I was breaking the law because I didn't have a driver's license. And there are only 10 states, DC and Puerto Rico added to that list, that allow undocumented immigrants to get driver's licenses. And the rest of us who get to work, who have to go pick up our kids from school, or we are driving ourselves to school, every time we, we get behind the wheel of that car, we know that if we get pulled over, there's a chance that we can get deported, that we can be separated from our families. Because we don't have driver's licenses, we can't get car insurance. So the roads are all, uh, in my, from my perspective, are actually more dangerous by us not allowing undocumented immigrants to get driver's licenses to get insurance. But I went back to campus my junior year in, in college thinking that having developed this idea that money could solve all my problems and wanting to have a lot of financial and professional success so that I could earn my way into America. Because that's another thing. I think we ask, um, we, we often ask immigrants, what are you doing to earn your citizenship? But we don't ask that of people who were born here. What did you do to earn your citizenship? What are you doing to be a real American? So because I had developed this idea, I started to think, what's the kind of job where I can make a lot of money and fix all of my problems? Ding, 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 Wall Street. So I, uh, I, I applied for an internship at Goldman Sachs. I got this internship. And remember, I still don't have real documents. I went to the internship, I did a really good job, and I was asked to come back full time. The day that I showed up to analyst training, I was incredibly nervous because I didn't know if the papers I had were going to stand out. Maybe they were going to look really fake compared to someone else's real papers. But somehow they worked. And somehow I started my coveted job as an analyst at Goldman Sachs. And looking back on it, I've realized that the reason I flew under the radar is because of the perceptions we have about undocumented immigrants. The picture in our mind when we think of Mexican immigrants is of criminals, is of, at the, at the worst, at the best, the only picture we have is of the people that are cleaning our homes and the people that are picking our strawberries and mowing our lawns. And by the way, those jobs make our country run and they're incredibly important and those people deserve the same amount of dignity as I do standing here today. But that's the only image we have. That's what we think immigrants aspire to. We don't aspire to that. We do those jobs in the hope that the next generation can do better and the next generation after that can do better than that. But that's the image that we have. So when I showed up at Goldman Sachs with my resume and having graduated with honors from a top five business school in the country, no one was gonna question my papers. No one was going to look at them and scrutinize them. It was more of a check the box. I wish I'd known that then, because then, um, then I think I wouldn't have been so, um, so scared. But my story is not unique, by the way. Um, here are a few more uh, undocumented immigrants who have done amazing things, even though they were undocumented. This is a Pulitzer Award-winning journalist, a neurosurgeon. Um, and, and the stories go on and on and on. But because we have that perception, that is the only thing we believe. I eventually um, became an American citizen on August 8th of 2014, but not without having to pay a very high price. 
I was on top of the world. I had become a vice president at Goldman. I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Who, for someone who was making $10,000 a year selling funnel cakes on the streets of San Antonio, was more than I could have imagined. And then I received a phone call that forever changed my life. In 2007, my dad got really sick. And remember, my parents have since moved back to Mexico. And so I was faced with another really difficult decision. My dad is really sick, but if I get on a plane and I go see him, I'm not going to be able to come back to the US. And if I do come back to the US, then I am going to have to get smuggled in somehow. But if I don't go and something happens to my dad, am I going to be able to live with myself? And in the hours that I spent agonizing over this decision, my dad passed away. On September 19th, it will be nine years. And every single year, I wish that I had made a different decision. I wish that I had gotten on that plane and gone to see my dad. But because I didn't, I never got to see my dad alive again. And that is an incredible high price to pay to pursue the American dream. I eventually married my longtime boyfriend. And then I had it all. I had a green card. I had a husband who could dance. And the world was great. Um, but having this green card really gave me the freedom to take a step back and ask myself, what is it that I want to do with my life? And that's when I realized that Wall Street wasn't it for me. Yesterday, I was uh, at Ellis Island. They showed a, a film there um, that is featuring my story. And it was this really incredible moment of, it was, it was really surreal to be on Ellis Island. And I had a copy of my book, and I'm at Ellis Island. And then I'm reminded of all the people and all the immigrants that came to Ellis Island. And we heard this morning on the poem that is inscribed at the Statue of Liberty. And I was reminded that this country has always been a country of immigrants. These are pictures of 1920s immigrants living in New York City in cramped tenement apartments. But there was also, these are the immigrants that made it. And even though they were working in sweatshops and 20 people lived in a cramped, tiny apartment, these were the ones who made it. Being on Ellis Island, I was reminded of all the people who'd never made it to New York, who got stuck at Ellis Island, who could see their dream across the river, but couldn't really reach it. So why is it that we celebrate these immigrants, but we don't celebrate the immigrants of today? What's the difference between the immigrants from the 1920s that came here in search of a better life and the immigrants of today who are coming here in the search of the very same thing? One of my favorite comedians, her name is Cristela Alonso, she often asks, why is it that we blame immigrants for stealing our jobs and then we also blame them for being lazy? How can a lazy person be stealing our jobs? Which one is it? My hope after leaving here today is that you will look deeper into these issues, that you will not make decisions or that you will not um, let your perceptions be shaped by 30 second sound bites and by really catchy, juicy headlines. My hope here is that you leave here today considering that there's a different perspective, considering that the issue of immigration is about immigrants. Immigrants like me, immigrants like the pictures I showed you, and we are people just like you, and we have dreams and ambitions and aspirations. We are not to be feared. Thank you.